in that every single weekend so far, we've had a feast to celebrate. With the first weekend we celebrated, which was the feast of the Nativity, which was the seventh, which is Sunday. The second feast was last Sunday, which we got the feast of circumcision. And then today we got another feast, and then the feast of the wedding of Cana at Galilee, which you know is, is the feast that the church celebrates when our Lord Jesus Christ did his very, very first miracle when he changed the water into wine. Now the question that I'm going to ask you today is, <clears throat> why the church celebrates this as a feast? And why, this, why the church makes a big deal out of such an event as, as, as happens today? We know that it's the first sign. That's what the gospel ended with, right? And it said, this is the beginning of the signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. This is like the first miracle that our Lord Jesus Christ ever did. But what is it that we're celebrating here? And let me tell you what the answer is not. We are not celebrating that our Lord Jesus Christ turned water into wine. That's not the miracle. Think about it. Would the church make a great miracle because our Lord made some wine out of some water? Doesn't Coors Brewing Company do the same thing and Budweiser do the same thing? Is that a great miracle that our Lord is able to make wine and we celebrate alcohol and things like that? That's not the miracle. Is the fact that he made wine. There has to be something else deeper inside and the wine and the water have to symbolize something. There's got to be some deeper meaning behind the water and the wine than we just celebrate that our Lord Jesus Christ had a good time at a party and all the people had, were drinking water, now they got to drink wine. There's got to be something deeper to that. So what does the wine and the water symbolize and what is it the church celebrates today? Well, <clears throat> if you want a clue to the meaning of the gospel, the church always tells us the meaning of the gospel in one sentence through the reading of the Psalms, okay? Before every gospel reading, there's a psalm that's read, and the psalm is like the title of the gospel. It's like the chapter heading for what we're about to read. And you know that there's three gospels that's read in the liturgy. Last night, Vespers, this morning, Matins, and then the liturgy gospel. I'll show you all three psalms, and you try to tell me what the water and the wine symbolize. Because look, each one talks about them. First, last night's Vespers psalm said, you have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. Okay? Matin Psalm this morning. And wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to fill his face, oil to make his face shine. O Lord, how manifold are your works. So the first two talk about wine. Then the liturgy psalm, which we just read, you are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people. The water saw you, and they were afraid. <clears throat> All three of the Psalms mention water or wine. And of course, the gospel culminated in Christ turning the water into wine. What's the water and what's the wine? Well, let's agree on this thing. Water is bad. Wine is good. Okay? Whatever it does symbolize, whatever water symbolizes something that's not good, Whatever wine symbolizes something that is good, because our Lord turned water into wine. And you see right there that the first two psalms associates wine with gladness and joy and rejoicing. And in the last psalm there, it says, Waters saw you and they were afraid. The waters went away from our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I heard a nice, song, uh, a nice sermon the other day by His Grace Emba Yusuf, the bishop in the southern diocese. And he was talking about this exact story about the water and the wine. He said that the wine represents love in marriage and the water represents the coolness in marriage or the lack of love in marriage. And he's speaking specifically about the marriage. And he, and he quoted or he referenced the, the book of love in the Bible, which is the book of Song of Solomon. And if you look in Song of Solomon, it gives us some more clues as to what the wine and the water is. First, it talks about wine in Song chapter 1. Verse 2 and 4, it says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Your love is better than wine. We will remember your love more than wine. So water, I'm sorry, wine is associated with love. What's water? In Song chapter 8, verse 6 and 7. It says, For love is as strong as death. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. <clears throat> if you want to know what the water and what the wine is, the wine is, like I said, the love in marriage. The water is the lack of love. Because fire, water, I'm sorry, wine, what Song of Solomon is saying, 
is like the love is like a fire in the marriage. And what water does is water quenches that fire and drowns out that wire, that, that fire. So let's go back to our gospel reading for today. If wine is love and water is lack of love, and I tell you that in John chapter 2, the gospel that we just read, our Lord Jesus Christ attended a wedding and he found only water, no wine. Only water, no wine. That made him sad. <clears throat> it's unfortunate, but if you look at the state of most marriages today, and I think if our Lord Jesus Christ was visiting a lot of homes, he'd find the same thing. He'd find a lot of homes where there's plenty of water, but not much wine. Just as he found right here, where there's like a coolness <clears throat> in that marriage. You know how one of the things about being Egyptian that we do, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, we joke about marriage, okay? And we joke about how saying about how, you know, we talk about, um, you know, about uh, the cross and death, and we say, yes, my wife is my cross. Or we joke and say that, you know, my husband is the pain, whatever. We joke and make funny jokes like that all the time, and it's funny and all that kind of stuff. But it's not funny if it's, if it's true, okay? And it's unfortunate that, and it's actually sad that, unfortunately, for the most, like I said, for most of the marriages today, you would find that there would be plenty of water, but not much wine. And unfortunately, what's really unfortunate about that is most people, at least the people in the story, recognized it, and the people in the story wanted to fix it. And the people in the story realized, hey, something's missing in this wedding. Something's missing in this marriage. And what was missing was that wine, which, like I said, represents that fire and that love. It is natural that in any marriage, okay, starts out fire, starts off wine, but it cools with time. Just like in the wedding party. It started off with plenty of wine, and I'm sure when the, when the party started, there was tons of wine. But what happens with time is that wine starts to dwindle and dwindle, and you end up left with only water. Now the question is, when that's you, what are you going to do about that? I know what God wants to do about that. I know what our Lord Jesus Christ wants to do because when I was listening to the gospel today, I saw that he was at a wedding and it had only water and no wine and he couldn't take it. He couldn't stand it. He could not accept it. And he said, I got to do something about this. Even it's not my time. It's not time for me to do any miracles. The time hasn't come for me, but this situation must end. I can't allow because this is so far against God's plan for marriage. It's so far from what God has envisioned for marriage to be for us, that he could not accept it. God's vision for marriage, if you want to know what it is, and you, the gospel that was read last night, the Vespers gospel, was from Matthew chapter 19. A passage which sometimes we, we don't understand what it's talking about. It's read it at weddings, and we think, basically in the beginning of this passage, some people come ask the Lord about divorce, and is it okay to have divorce and all that kind of stuff. And we think the passage is focused on divorce. The passage is not about divorce. The passage is about marriage. It's not about the negative. It's about the positive. And after being asked about divorce, this is what he says, Matthew 19, verse 3 to 6. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Do you understand what God's saying right there? What our Lord Jesus Christ is saying is that God's plan for your marriage is unity and oneness. Okay? Is complete unity and two becoming one flesh. That's what he wants. It has not, it, yeah, he's it started off talking about divorce, but that's not the issue. He's not saying that as long as you're not divorced, you're okay. What he's saying is the goal for your marriage is to become one flesh. And anything less than that oneness is something that doesn't make him happy. It's something that he is not content with, even though we are. What I'm saying is God wants you to have wine in your marriage. Whether you want wine or whether you see the need for wine or not, God wants you to have wine. And if you look in today's gospel, today's gospel is a beautiful message about how he's able to transform even situations full of water, even when there's not a drop of wine around, even when it's just pots and pots and pots of water, he's able to take that and make it into wine. He's able to take a marriage that's cool and make it hot. He's able to take a marriage that's lacking intimacy and make it oneness and one flesh and two become one. <clears throat> and the best thing that he's able to do, or the best thing that you see from this gospel, is if you were paying attention in the gospel reading, 
They started off with wine. They lost the wine. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave them new wine. How does the guest or the, the people of the party compare the new wine to the old wine? It's saying at the end of the story, it says, I never had wine like this in my life. It says usually at the end, the bad wine comes out. But when our Lord Jesus Christ makes wine, it's never bad wine. He's able to take, even if you had wine and lost all, he's able to take you and make it even 10,000 times even greater than it was at the beginning. The question is how that happens. How does he do that? What's the process that takes place? <clears throat> how this oneness comes in marriage? Well, my guess is that as I'm sitting here talking to you about the wine in marriage and the beauty and the oneness and the intimacy and the, all this kind of stuff and painting this great picture of two becoming one flesh, I think that each one of you is falling, most people here is falling into like one or two categories in the way you're thinking. Some people are thinking, that's impossible. And some people are thinking, no problem, that's easy. Let's deal with each one of these viewpoints. First, the people who said, no problem. No problem, this is easy. Easy to just have this kind of fire and love. Easy to have this kind of wine. Easy to, because we are in love. Probably the people who are thinking that, most of you are single. Okay? Most of you probably were thinking that, either just newly married or probably hoping to get there kind of soon. Because if you think it's easy to have fire in your marriage, you are sadly mistaken. Hey, this isn't a TV show, okay? This isn't Hollywood and the movies. Life isn't that easy, and life isn't all la-la land and all the nonsense that you see on TV. Every single marriage starts in love, okay? Every single marriage starts with the fire. Every single marriage starts the same. No one gets married saying, uh, you know, no one gets married that way. Everyone gets married knowing there's going to be fire and this and that. But a lot of them lose it. A lot of them end up with just water. So what that says to me is that it's not easy. Because no matter how much wine you have, if it's human wine, it must be limited. So if, it's, if you're relying on love and in love and feeling love and all that kinds of nonsense, you will run out, okay? Now, some of you may have a lot of in love, so you run out after five years. Some of you may have more in love, you run out after ten years. But you're just going to run out eventually because in love, it's, it's a limited pool, okay? So I'm sorry if I'm dashing the hopes of all the romantics and this and that and the people who cry when they hear the love song on the radio and all that kind of stuff. That's nice, but that ain't going to carry you through marriage, all right? There has to be more. You have to find a way to replenish that love. You have to find another source for that love. So, to you people, I say, love is not enough. <clears throat> love is not, no matter what Hollywood tells you, love is not enough. Anyone who says, all we need, forget about the people who say, all we need is love. That's not true. Plenty of people start off with lots of love, end up with lots of water. You don't need just love. You need Jesus. And if you don't have the Lord Jesus in your marriage, these people didn't have Christ in that room with them, they wouldn't have had any wine. So that's the first group of people who said, no problem, this is easy, fire, love. And the second group of you saying just the opposite. We're saying, not, not saying no problem, saying big problem. Saying that's impossible in my marriage. This is most likely, I said the first group was the single people, this is probably the experienced people in marriage. Okay? Those who are well experienced in, in marriage are probably saying, no way. Okay, that was nice. You know, when we were kids, okay, okay, things like that, okay? When we were kids, okay, this love stuff, but not anymore, okay? That fire stuff has gone away and all that kind of stuff. You know what my answer to these people is? They say it's impossible to have wine in your marriage. You know what my answer is? I'm going to surprise you. I agree with you. I agree with you. Some of you are saying, oh my goodness, when Anthony's only been married five years and already he's agreeing with us. No, I'm agreeing with you. It is impossible. It's 100% possible. It is impossible for any two human beings to get together that you are selfish and I'm selfish. And you have ego and I have ego. And you have pride and I have pride. And you have all these bad stuff and I have all these bad stuff. It is 100% impossible for us to have wine that lasts forever. But you know what? Who cares if it's impossible? God's specialty is doing impossible things. Luke chapter 18 verse 27. That the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. I know it's impossible. I agree with you it's impossible. I agree with you that there's no way that it can happen. But there's also no way that water can turn to wine. There's also no way that dead people can rise again. There's also no way that five loaves and two fish can feed 5,000 people. There's no way these things happen. But they happen 
when our Lord Jesus Christ is there. <clears throat> Being impossible never stopped Christ from doing anything. So why would it stop him now in my marriage? Yes, it's impossible for two people to have that fire and that, that wine to go on forever. But he specializes in doing the impossible. The thing is, <clears throat> the reason that I can speak about this more than anyone else, because I am a living example of God doing the impossible. <clears throat> and I remember five years ago, six years ago, whatever, when me and Marianne started getting together and this and that, okay, right before, especially at the beginning and right before that, anyone who knew me said, this boy's going to have a tough time getting married, okay? This boy's really going to have a hard time because, let's just put it, I'm not the most emotional kind of a person, okay? I'm not very good at expressing emotions and stuff like that. So anyway, so me and Marianne got together, and she later on told me that, that you know, this was in the back of her mind. How's this boy who, you know, can't express any emotions and stuff like that, like, how's this going to work out? And she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and, you know, with Boom Shoy's help and this and that and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, I got to the point, I'm not an emotional person by any means, but I was able to do, you know, hold my own and stuff like that and express a little bit of emotions when it needs to be expressed. And Marianne, to this day, if you go to, like, her journal, like, has the day, like, May 15, 2001, the day that her fiancé had emotions, okay? The day that, that an emotionless monster, okay, discovered emotions, was able to express himself and have a little bit of blood inside him. She considers that, like, the greatest miracle in the history of our marriage. And the people who know me from before and know me now, okay, know that that's, like, not, like, back then I couldn't do some of the stuff that I have to do that I do right now, not have to do. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is, if God is able to take an emotionless guy like me, okay, and turn me into someone that I can at least hold their own emotionally, okay, at least get by, if God is able to take the John 2 people who didn't have any water and give them wine, then I don't think that there's anyone here who God can't do the same for as well. Again, impossible is nothing. Okay, impossible means Nothing. If God is able to do it for me, and God is able to do it for here, he's able to do it for you as well. This is his specialty, turning something ordinary into something extraordinary. And if you want to know what we celebrate today, that's what we celebrate. That's the feast of today. The feast of today is taking the ordinary and making it extraordinary. Taking the water, not just the physical water, but taking the water in, the, in life, in our marriage, and making it into wine. The sacrament of marriage is this mystery every single time we celebrate a wedding. Because what it is, it's taking two people. Look at the two people as water pots. It's taking two people, water pots don't have much value in them. Just pots of water full of, full of stuff that doesn't do much good. And it's taking two people and transforming them into something new. Because two people, every time we have a uh, wedding, two water pots walk down this aisle. But by the end... You just have one jar of wine going down the aisle. That's what happens. It's a mystery. It's something that can't be explained. It's something that is impossible. But if you think about it, all of Christianity is a mystery. Everything God does is a mystery. So don't let this one trip you up. How is the Trinity united? Three and one and one and three. It's a mystery. How is the two natures of Christ united into one perfect nature? The full humanity and full divinity. It's a mystery. How are we all united together in one body in Christ? It's a mystery. How are two people, man and woman, full of own kinds of, like I said, sinful nature, ego, selfishness, how is two people supposed to unite and live with the fire? It's a mystery. Something that I can't explain, but it's something I know that God can do. But by the same token, here's one thing I know for certain, that if two people unite, and if two people try to live together, and two people try to do this unity without the assistance of God, without the presence of God, without the unity of three, good luck, man. Good luck to you. Good luck to you, because it ain't going to work. I don't care how much in love you have. I don't care how perfect it seems. All them Hollywood people, it's perfect, and she's beautiful, and he's beautiful, and he's rich, and she's rich, and they're in love, and he's in love, and all that kind of stuff. Next, doesn't last. Never lasts. It's a disaster if you try to do it without God. But with God, it's a mystery and a miracle, and that's what we celebrate today, is how God creates that oneness in us. You know, in the wedding ceremony, one of the things that we pray over and over and over and over, we keep saying, like, 
um, like God who transformed the water into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, uh, bless your two servants, uh, Ed and Jill. Or God who um, blessed the water, made it into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, uh, protect your servants, whatever. And say, God who blessed and made the water into wine, and it says whatever. You know what, he, what we're saying is God was able to transform something really bad into something really good, do the same thing with this couple. And God was able to take something that was bad. And actually, we later on pray that we say that we say that God, that you would transform things that cause division into things that bring unity. That's at the very end of the wedding prayers. That you would transform things that bring division, water, into things that bring unity, wine. And that's what we pray for every single wedding, every single marriage. This is his specialty. So again, I go back to the question of how this happens and how we make this happen for our life. The secret to having the wine in your marriage comes from a place. There's a certain place that you need to understand. And that place, the source of the wine, is the altar of God. This is the source of power in your marriage. This is the source of wine in your life. When a wedding begins, the deacons and the priest, representing the angels, representing Christ himself, bring both parties with the hymn of procession down the middle of the aisle and bring them where? Right in front of the altar of God. And they stand before the altar of God and they do all the prayers. And then at the very, very end, the very last thing that happens is those two people bow their heads and kneel before the same altar of God. Your marriage starts in front of the altar. And your marriage ends in front of the altar. And the source of power in your life is that very altar of God. And the day that you leave the altar, the day that you're trying to do marriage without the altar is the day that you're not going to have any wine. The marriage can't be separate from the altar. Okay, We can't do weddings in the street. We can't do weddings in houses. The wedding has to be in front of the altar of God because that's the source. And the day that you stop visiting that altar... And then you stop relying on that altar of God is the day that you're, got, that you're going to be in trouble. What's the altar represent? The altar's more than, don't think when I say the altar, I mean that means we need to pray. Yeah, it means we need to pray. What is the altar, though? It's more than just pray. Very good. Someone said it. Anytime you hear altar in the Old Testament, the altar is where there was a sacrifice that was made. That's what happened at the altar. It was a sacrifice and sacrifice is even the nice word. The real word is death. Okay, that's what happens at the altar. If something dies, may not be you, but something has to die. When there's an altar, someone has to get killed. Whether it's a cat or a, a cow or a bull or something has to die at the altar to be sacrificed. I'm saying the secret of the wine in your marriage is the altar. And it's the same sacrifice and the same death. If you were paying attention to the Pauline epistle, when I first read the Pauline epistle, I thought it had absolutely nothing to do with today. I felt like it was, in, in, like it was a mistake, a typo, or something like that. And then it hit me what it was talking about. Does anyone remember what the Pauline was about? It talked a lot about like death and crucifying yourself and dying to sin and all that kind of stuff, an old man and new man. <clears throat> like I said, I wasn't understanding what this had to do with anything until I read it again. Let me read just an excerpt from here. It came from Romans chapter 6. Starting in verse 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we too should no longer be slaves of sin. It starts off talking about that our old man was crucified with him, that there has to be, like something has to die. Something has to be thrown away. The water pots have to kind of go and be gotten rid of. Why? Well, that continues on. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. You see, the secret, the source for the oneness, the wine, the fire, is that there has to first be a sacrifice, an old man being thrown away, an old way of thinking, an old way of acting, an old way of me, 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 going away, and a new, because that's the only way that the new way can come in. The only way for the water, I'm sorry, for there to be wine, is that you get rid of the water, because water quenches wine. Okay, if you go back to the water and fire, the only way to have a fire in here is to get rid of the water that's in here. And it's the same thing when it comes to marriage. The only way to live the new life is to get rid of the old life. 
The only way to have the oneness is to get rid of the individuality, okay, and the me, me, me kind of attitude. He summarizes it best in verse 11 later on in that same passage when St. Paul says, that likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's talking about dead to sin, alive to Christ. I'm talking about dead to yourself and alive to the new oneness in your marriage. Dead to the water, dead to the things that kill, and alive to the wine in marriage. <clears throat> Christ's vision of marriage is different than the world's vision. The world's vision of marriage, what the world teaches you is compromise. Two people come together, one's coming from here, one's coming from here, and the two meet halfway and live together and everyone's happy. Everyone's not happy. Okay? Because if I have this person here and this person here, and they meet like this, it's just a matter of time before there starts to be tendencies that pull each one the other direction. Christianity does not say meet halfway. What does Christianity say? Meet 100% of the way. It says that you over here, I want you to go all the way over here. And you who's over here, I want you to go all the way that's over here. And then you know, when, if you're over here and you're over here and you go like this, and then you compromise, you know what the compromise ends up being? It ends up being like a reverse compromise. And you're like sealed by each other this way. Okay? Christianity doesn't teach a 50-50. Christianity teaches 100% death. And if you want that good stuff in marriage, and you want the fire, and you want the wine, requires 100% sacrifice and 100% death. And some people hear that and say, you know what, I'm not willing. You know what, if you're not ready to lay down your life for your spouse, and you're not ready to give up all your stuff in marriage, you ain't ready to get married. End of story. You're not ready. Some people say, no, I'm ready. I'm, no, you're not ready. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how much a degree you have. I don't care how much money you have in your bank account. If you are not ready to lay down your life, you're not ready for marriage. I know some guys who are not even ready to lay down the remote control for their wife, to put down, to put down the, the magazine for their spouse. If you're not ready to lay down everything, you're not ready for the, for the fire and for the wine. What I'm saying is marriage is not the golden rule. The golden rule is do unto others you would have them do unto you. That's not, that's not marriage. Marriage is do unto others, regardless of what in the world they do to you, it's talking about like a complete death. Are you ready for some wine? Are you ready for some wine is the question that our Lord is asking us today. Are you ready for some wine? Are you ready to get rid of the water and start having some wine? If you're not ready and you're not willing to do all that stuff and lay down your life and all that kind of stuff, don't expect there to be any wine. But if you are ready for some wine, <clears throat> last piece of advice I'll give you is actually not my advice. It's advice that St. Mary would give you. St. Mary said one thing in today's gospel. You remember what she said? It's the advice that I think she would give each one of us. Whatever he says to you, do it. That's her only piece of advice. That's what she told the servants. She said, look here. This marriage is missing wine. You're stuck with water. I don't know how it's going to get fixed, but trust me, whatever he says, do it. How did it turn out for those people at that wedding? It turned out pretty good for them. And I think the same thing is for us as well. Our Lord Jesus Christ wants to bless each one of our marriages. And the sac it's, it's sad that, like I said in the beginning, that marriages have become like that. And it's a joke, and it's, a, it's all that kind of stuff. It's not what the vision is supposed to be. The vision of marriage is supposed to be wine, and overflowing, and fire, and all kinds of good stuff. But the question is, are you willing to obey whatever he says to do, even if that means something that you don't want to do, are you willing to obey whatever he says to do in order to get that wine? If you are, I promise you, there's no marriage. There's no marriage that can't be full of wine. There's no marriage that has to stay stuck with the water. If you're willing to do what God tells you to do, glory be to God forever. Amen.